Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 116 of the podcast. And today I'm helping you with time estimation. <laughs> so what is that? Basically, I wanna help you be able to look at a quilt and just like a pattern, and just by looking at it, think, okay, that I might be mucking around with that quilt for a month. I might be mucking around with it for a year. You know, I might be working on that for the rest of my life. So I want to help you be able to look at a project and based on the construction, your skill, how it's going to be quilted, what kind of machine you're going to quilt it on, what style of quilting you're going to use. All of these things have a really big impact on how long something is going to take to be finished. Uh, so I really glitched out on this episode. It's pretty long, <laughs> but if you want to get straight to it, please jump ahead. So below the video or below the player or um, wherever you are listening to this podcast, you will find right below there is a timestamp and it will say whatever time it is that I finish with the intro here and move on to the topic of the podcast. So jump ahead if you want to get straight to it and start learning about how much time your next quilt project is going to take. Uh, so that is, it was a lot of fun. I had a really great time. I pulled out lots of different projects as examples, so that was good. Uh, and then I kind of had a brainwave as I was thinking about this for this particular project. So I have one more thing to add to everything that I shared in the podcast. I shot that already. Um, and so I have one more thing to add, and that is you can always find an alternative creative solution to any tricky quilt. So in my head, this quilt has remained unfinished forever. Uh, years and years and years. I think I might have put this together in 2010. Might be newer than that, but it was when AccuQuilt came out because the feather die was one of their very first dies and that's what this was cut from. Uh, so 2010, 2012, something like that. And I've saved it and saved it and saved it because I just love the colors and they were so cheerful, but I have not been able to finish it because in order to make this quilt last, I need to blanket stitch or satin stitch around every single one of these feather shapes. and. I do not have time. It's not going to happen. So I've just come up with kind of, I think a creative solution and that is I'm gonna go on ahead and baste it and I'm going to just simply quilt inside each feather shape with a little internal echo and then let it go raw. And I, I'm able to do that and say that's a good solution because the alternative is either giving this away to someone else so it can burden their lives <laughs> or it's to never finish it or to throw it away. And I don't like any of those options. I, I've kept this quilt for this long for a reason. And I think that reason is that I really like it. It's really creative. It's, it, it's, it's kind of my style. It's bright and cheerful and happy. And it's rainbowy too. I love rainbows. So I really want to finish it myself, but I don't have time to do blank, blanket stitching or satin stitching on hundreds of feathers. It's just not going to happen. So doing that little internal echo is the best solution. So when I came up with that and realized, you know, I can just do, you know, let it go raw and kind of the quilt will be different from what I had in mind when I originally fused it together, but it will be done. And that's kind of the whole point. So I think that is one additional lesson for this uh, episode. And that is um, if the idea you have, the method that you have is very complex and time consuming, you are allowed to change it and simplify it. And that's a-okay. All right, so a few quick things. I wanted to get straight to our giveaway this week. I forgot to do it. I forgot to pick someone last week. Or no, I picked someone that I forgot to show you. I wanted to give away these two strip packs. So these are two and a half inch Kona cotton strip packs. I've got a dark blue and a light blue and I figured they should go together. So they are going to go together and they are going to Heather Henton. So congratulations, Heather. Uh, in order to enter our giveaway, you need to be a member of our Quilt Friends Club. And you can check that out at 
quiltfriends.club. And this is a members only membership group uh, where you get to post questions and share pictures and post reviews of your sewing machines and interact with amazing quilters from around the world. It's a small group. It is off of all other social media and it is very, very kind and supportive. Uh, so I do a little bonus giveaway uh, for the podcast. So Heather's gonna be getting these strips and then next week what's going to be up for grabs is this stash and dash fold over organizer. It is a kit. It comes with everything that you need except for fabric. I made one of these and I shared kind of the, I just shared some quilting tips about it because they're so, the instructions are so solid in this pack guys. So this is super, super awesome. It is a by Annie organizer. If you want to go down a whole other tangent of awesomeness and get into bag making, then I would say by Annie is who you need to go check out because her bags are awesome. They, they really kick butt and her, her, her patterns are very technical, meaning that you're, you're going to first walk through all of the um, kind of construction of the smaller pieces and then, you know, and that will feel like it takes forever. But then at the, you know, towards the very end, you're putting everything together and all comes together really quick. So I think that you're really going to like this. So that is up for grabs next week. And a super special thank you to all of our new members, Mara Hirschbach, Kathy Starks, Bridget White, Deborah Hunsacker, Barbara Blodgett, Gina Maslow, Brenda Landureth, Elizabeth Fuhrer, Rita Jensen, Barbara Delarwell, Susan Nixon, Daz Schongarth, Cecile Ellis, and Sandra Tier. And thank you guys so much for joining. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name a little bit. That's not my strong suit, but I am working on it. I am definitely working on that because what I am starting this week is audiobook narration, something I have been wanting to get into really for years, but I only kind of put everything together and, and kind of got my act together about it about six months ago. But I am actually gonna sit down and put myself in jail and I am gonna record the audio for my new book that is Leah Day's Goddess Quilts. So that is gonna be recorded. And then I'm going to record Melly the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. That is my quilt fiction fantasy story about a little girl who goes into a magical quilt world. And what I wanna do is get back into Mally and write book two and book three back to back. But I thought about it and I realized, you know, I really need to get back mentally into that world. And the best possible way to do that would be to read Mally cover to cover and do the audiobook, and then I can listen to it. Cause I am, I am an audiophile. I'm listening to audio all the time. I love audio. So I can listen to it several times. And then the major questions that I still have, you know, the kind of like, oh, I really wanna, I think that's really gonna help me find those little nuggets and really start playing. So I'm excited about that. And uh, I am gonna go on a hot air balloon ride on Saturday. And this is another thing for Mally book two. Uh, I already knew that hot air balloons were going to be part of the, that book. And, uh, and I said to Josh a couple months ago, I said, oh, I really need to ride a hot air balloon <laughs> at some point this summer. And I said that to him, I think in June. And then just so happens, um, this farm where we go and we get uh, fresh pork and milk and butter and cheese and stuff, they're having a big farm day and they're gonna have a hot air balloon ride. So I'm super excited about that. And that's gonna be absolutely inspiring for Mally book two. She's gonna go on another amazing adventure in the world of Quilst and I can't wait. So if that piqued your interest at all, come and check out Mally the Maker. You can find her at mallythemaker.com. And the Goddess Quilt Book, one last note about that, guys. The Goddess Quilt Book is coming soon. We have decided to limit the pre-order to only the people that are on the pre-order newsletter list. So in order to sign up, you need to go to leoday.com slash goddess and sign up. You are going to get a notification when the book goes on pre-order and that's, it's going to be limited to you guys because we thought about it and I've got a, um, the regular print edition and then we have a new extra thing I'm going to be showing you in two weeks that's all coming out and this could get really, really huge and overwhelming. So I'm going to keep it very, very simple and yes, it's only going to be for those newsletter people. So come and check it out at leahday.com slash goddess. 
All right, that's it. I kept it short today. <laughs> I kept this short so that way we can get straight to the podcast. So enjoy learning more about estimating the amount of time any particular project is going to take to make. Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 116 of the podcast. And today I'm chatting about how long our projects take. It's a good estimation. I wanna kind of share my game plan and give you an estimation so you can look at a project. Maybe if you're shopping around and looking in a store, you can take a look at a project and go, no, oh, that might not be a good project for me right now. Or you can say, yes, I have time for that. I'm gonna go on ahead and pick up that nice kit and tackle that this month. So this is gonna be a podcast episode where I really want you to kind of write down some notes and some things that you can ask yourself as you are considering taking on a new project. Last podcast episode was about 10 steps to tackle your UFOs. So if you have a lot of unfinished projects, definitely listen to that podcast. That's gonna help you out a lot as far as really getting focused on finishing your unfinished projects and being able to Finish them so that you can use them and enjoy them and focus on finishing the most meaningful projects first because obviously what's the point in finishing a project that doesn't mean anything to you? There's no point at all, right? I mean, it's not like you want to finish something and be like, wow, I'm so happy that I finished this quilt that I hate. Really? <laughs> There's no point to that. So don't do that. Finish the projects that you find most meaningful, that you like the most, that you cannot wait to see in your home. And real quick, I wanted to tell you guys about the project that I'm working on right now as I talk to you. I am working on a double wedding ring quilt. Very, very meaningful because this was cut out of the clothing that Josh's grandmother wore. And I am making this quilt for my mother-in-law who has had some health problems. I'm really hoping to finish this up by Christmas. So this is actually a very topical topic for me right now because I have projects that I really want to create that I really wanna create on a time limit, get it done and be able to gift it to someone that I love quite a lot. And so this is the height of a meaningful project. So I love being able to work on this while I'm chatting with you. And I can also share with you, you know, kind of this has given me the idea for sharing this podcast because I can actually estimate my time remaining on this project based on just the little bit of work that I've done on it so far. So I think this is really fascinating. So very first thing about uh, thinking through how much time a project will take, kind of this time estimation thing. How does this work? Well, the first thing that you're gonna need is a little bit of quilting experience. It is really hard to do this if you were a total beginner and you've never made a quilt before, okay? So I'm gonna say from the start, if you've never made a quilt before, it's gonna be really hard to estimate your time. And I would say generally first quilts can take anywhere from one to three months, depending on the style and how complicated it is. Um, you know, and this is just an average, I would say. This is my very first quilt. I believe it took about two months to create from cutting the fabric to sewing on the binding. It might've taken a little bit longer than that. The sheer volume of the number of techniques that you have to learn to make your first quilt makes it overwhelming. And that makes it also hard to estimate time. Uh, and, and that's gonna definitely come into our whole, you know, kind of complicated estimation. <laughs> but understand that if you're just starting out, this is a tricky thing to really you know, have a, an understanding of, a good feel for, but the more experience that you get, the better you're going to get at this. And, and the more you're going to be able to kind of wrap your brain around, all right, I'm gonna be committed to this for six months, or I'm gonna be committed to this for three months, and really start mapping out that time and kind of putting brackets around it, and then not buying more stuff to fill in, you know, whenever you feel that creative urge, go and create rather than going and buying more stuff that adds more pressure and adds more complication to your life, right? So the very first step when you're considering adding a new project to your plate is to look at the construction method. So I identified four main construction methods for quilts. A quilt can be pieced, and that is a traditional pieced technique with a straight seam, with a quarter inch patchwork foot 
that is actually fairly easy and it's fairly fast. If all of your seams are straight, if all of your units are predictable straight edge units, then that is gonna actually be the fastest technique that you can use to construct your quilt. So if you look at the quilt pattern and it's just straight seams all piecing, it's automatically gonna be faster. It gets slower, it slows down, if there are any curved seams at all, because curved seams not only take more time to cut, they take more time to piece, okay? If there is applique, applique takes a lot more time. You have to prep the fabric, and depending on the applique method, you have to prepare templates. So you can't just cut with a rotary cutter and a ruler, you have to prepare templates, right? and then those templates or fusible web go onto the fabric, then it's cut or prepped in a specific way, then it's constructed and put together. So applique does take more time, it's usually more complex, and it usually takes up more space. And this is another thing that, you know, we, it, it's easy to not take into account the volume of quilting, but uh, when I'm cutting yardage, I can take up, you know, I can take up 36 inches wide from my yardage uh, and you know kind of fold it up and I only need about that much space to cut yardage. I'm not very comfortable but I can do it right so I need about that much space on my table for that. When I'm preparing applique I like to have my entire ironing board open so I spread out and then I have my fabric spread out too so I usually take up an entire table. Uh, and my tables are big, so I will take up the entire table when I am working on an applique quilt. And the size of quilt comes into that too, we'll get into that later, but uh, the different techniques take a different amount of space. Space equals time, because of course you've got to clear that table in order to be able to use the entire surface. So where I might be able to quickly cut out some strips in a, like a little corner of my table and not have to clean the whole thing up, I would not be able to do that with an applique quilt where I have to prep the freezer paper, prep templates, prep fusible web, any of that stuff. I'm gonna clear the whole table off, that's gonna add more time, right? And if I don't finish it all in one day or finish it all in one week, then that is continual clear off the table, pull everything out. It really starts to ratchet up when it's like, oh, every time I pull that stuff out, I've gotta do all of this work and that starts to really add up. Right? Whereas piecing, traditional piecing, traditional cutting, straight lines, straight seams makes it a lot easier to make and that's going to make it a lot faster. Okay? The last two um, construction techniques are a little bit more esoteric, not as common, and that is whole cloth quilts and then show quilts. So a whole cloth quilt is a quilt that is entirely designed to be quilted. Uh, it is not pieced, it does not have any fabric sewn onto the surface of other fabrics. It is one large piece of fabric. Technically, the construction of a whole cloth quilt is faster than piecing because all you have to do is design your quilt and then mark it on plain fabric. It is less common, however, which adds to the technique factor of learning new techniques and new skills. So that takes more time. And then depending on the complexity of the whole cloth quilt design, it can take days, if not a week or two, to mark the entire complex design if you're making a particularly large quilt. So I would say a whole cloth is going to be it's gonna run somewhere between a pieced quilt and an applique quilt. I really do believe that applique quilts take the most time to construct other than show quilts. <laughs> Let me give that caveat. Show quilts, of course, take the most time because they're usually a combination of techniques. You can use piecing, you can use applique, you can do a whole cloth. Show quilts, let's just go on ahead and say from the outside, are the most time consuming and complex. If the quilt, and I should caveat again, if the quilt is designed specifically for show from the outset. And a show quilt is not a bed quilt. A show quilt is a completely different animal. It's a completely different monster. It's its, its own unique thing, guys. And I have another episode about show quilting. So please go check that out if you're interested in understanding more about a show quilt from the ground up. If you're wanting to compete and really wanting to win, it's a really good episode for you to listen to and understand 
that it is a completely different animal. It's not a typical quilt. And because of that, when I made my first show quilt, I really felt like I relearned how to quilt from the ground up. Like it taught me everything all over again times 10, right? So that's what a show quilt will do for you. But understand it is going to be a slow process. When I go into these days thinking, okay, I wanna start another show quilt. I'm thinking I'm gonna be committed to that quilt. It's gonna be in my space, in my studio, floating around the house for a year. I, am, I have to go into that committed to a year long project. And that's largely because I don't have a lot of time for it, but it's also because that's the commitment of time and design and thinking through techniques, learning new techniques, and the quilting, which is usually a lot more complex and a lot more dense and intense, okay? So understand those four construction techniques, piecing, applique, whole cloth, and show quilting, right? Piecing, traditional straight seam piecing is going to be the fastest. A whole cloth quilt is going to be your next fastest if you've done it before. If you haven't done it before, it will probably be slower. Applique is gonna be the slow, very pretty slow and show quilting is gonna be the absolute so, slowest. So when you look at a pattern, and let's just say for an example, it is a gorgeous Baltimore album applique, hand applique piece with each block is unique and has at least at minimum 50 different little itsy bitsy tiny pieces. You know, both Baltimore albums are typically like a, a basket overflowing with flowers and the petals are all individual and they're all kind of flowing out of the basket. You know, if it's like a minimum of 50 pieces per block, you're gonna be mucking around with that for a year. That's a show quilt. That's like applique on crack, right? <laughs> so, you know, it takes it to a different level when you're thinking about something like that. If it's like an applique daisy and it's that big and it's just very simple, very, you know, very, very easy shapes, you know, it's a different scale, but I still feel like applique is our, our most time consuming construction technique other than show quilting. Your next choice about construction has to do with the type of fabric that you use. So let's go back to, you know, obviously we know piecing, applique, whole cloth. Now, what are you going to make that quilt out of? Are you gonna use a pre-cut or are you gonna use yardage? If it's a pre-cut, you will save time. It will go faster, right? Because the fabric is already cut possibly to width for you. So you will not need to trim it up. You can just go on ahead and piece those two and a half inch strips together. You can go on ahead and piece those five inch squares or those 10 inch squares together and it's already ready to go. If you are working with yardage, yardage, especially for someone like me, I pre-wash everything, I starch everything. So automatically yardage is going to be treated very differently from pre-cuts, which you can't really pre-wash and prep the same way. You can't wash a pre-cut without having it fall apart. So yardage takes more time, basically, in short. If you're gonna work with yardage, I really do think that it's a good practice to pre-wash it, starch it, iron it. That way it's flat, it's crisp, it's easier to cut, and it's going to result in much more accurate pieces. Meaning if you cut, if you prep the fabric properly and then you cut exactly two and a half inch strips, there is no contest that strip you cut will always be a million times more accurate than that pre-cut bought off the shelf that was cut by a machine, okay? Um, of course, it takes more time. So uh, this is a primary part of what dad does for us. Dad, my dad works for us and he, pre-washes, he washes my fabric, he starches it, he presses it whenever we're working on a book or a big project, dad is doing all of that prep so I can be shooting videos. So that lets you know how much time this can take. I mean, for me, prepping up the fabric for a new quilt, depending on the size, can take one or two weeks of time, okay? And that's not, that's before we even really start cutting it to exact shapes or even start piecing it together. So working with yardage takes more time. And I oftentimes will get emails from people that get kits. Uh, so they order a kit online from somewhere and then they end up with these big massive pieces of fabric. They don't know how to cut them. They maybe don't even have selvages. So it's really hard to figure out how to cut those pieces of fabric. And I've gotten some really, 
you know, distraught quilter emails um, from people that have ended up just way over their head on these projects with fabric that they don't know how to work with. So I would say a general piece of advice, if you are just starting out, if it is your first quilt, a pre-cut is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to get started with to just understand the basics and uh, it'll get you started faster. So you're gonna see more of an instant gratification kind of thing. Uh, and you're gonna see those blocks come together easier and faster than they would if you had to do the whole nine yards of prepping up fabric, starching, pressing, and cutting. Uh, and all of those steps, there's just so many nuanced steps to quilting that it can be very overwhelming. So I think starting with pre-cuts is a great way to start. But as you evolve as a quilter, as the years go by and you gain skill, there will come a time when the pre-cuts just don't cut it anymore. And you'll want to start making more complex quilts. You're gonna wanna start doing some more challenging things. As I said in the last podcast, we do this because it's hard not because it's easy. I mean, who cuts up fabric just to sew it back together again, right? <laughs> We're crazy people. So you're gonna reach a point where the pre-cuts just stop cutting it and you're gonna wanna ramp up your skill a little bit. If you start feeling bored doing the same thing over and over again, that's a sign that you need to start changing things up and doing something different. And that's a sign that you need to start working with yardage and start learning how that works. It's very different. Uh, it's also a better use of your money because you end up being able to cut more, you, you can cut more strategically with yardage and I think that you use less fabric for the amount of money spent, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, and it really just depends on the, the quilt pattern. You know, if you're working with applique and it's lots of little pieces, then a little pre-cut charm pack, it's gonna work great. My general advice would be, no matter what fabric you use, always starch it, always press it. It's always gonna give you a better start to your project, um, it, whether it's a pre-cut or a yardage, because it's gonna be stiffer and that's gonna make it easier to work with and that's gonna make it so much easier to control. Fabric is wiggly. It likes to go all over the place, but when you starch it, you tell it who's boss, right? And I have another podcast episode because I know the next question you're gonna ask is, wait a minute, what about starch and bugs and all the stuff I've heard about starch being bad? Go listen to that other podcast episode because <laughs> that is a whole nother rant for a whole nother day. Uh, yeah, uh, so basically I believe starch is perfectly fine, but yes, go listen to that podcast episode. You can hear a whole lot more about it. So the next thing to think about with your next project is the purpose of the project. Is your quilt a bed quilt or slash throw? Okay, we're gonna kind of lump that all together. A quilt that is designed to be soft and cuddly, okay, that you're gonna curl up with, that you're gonna wanna snuggle with on the couch, that you're gonna wanna cuddle with under your bed, that's going to be soft and drapey. It's going to hug you. It's going to wear over time and just become softer and more pliable. Okay, so that's purpose number one is bed quilt slash throw, cuddly quilt basically. Second purpose would be a bed spread. Now this is kind of something new I'm kind of thinking about and that is a quilt designed to not be cuddly but still go on your bed, the purpose of which is purely decorative. And I, and I add this because I was thinking about my grandmother and she had several bed spreads that she would spread over the bed, I think mostly because it made her happy, it was pretty, but as soon as we came over <laughs> and started rolling around in the bed, she'd take that bed spread off. You know, it was not designed to be used. It was purely decorative. So think about that. This kind of project would be designed to be uh, more densely quilted, more artistic. Um, it, would, it would not be soft and cuddly. Uh, it could be, but it would not be designed really to be soft and cuddly. It would design, be designed purely for the uh, beautification of the bed. And it would not be designed to cuddle with, to curl up with underneath. It would be designed to be stiffer and to cover the bed when it was not in use. Okay, so that's kind of, I, I, I thought of that. I thought of her when, with this and I thought, like, you know, that does need its own category because, you know, you could put a special quilt on your bed just to enjoy seeing your bed made up, but then take that off and not sleep under it 
you know, or it may be like a guest bedroom where you have that nice quilt draped over it. Um, and then that goes off whenever someone actually comes over to sleep under that, that on that bed. That's just an idea. It's not a very common thing though. Uh, I would say that that is kind of a slightly more esoteric kind of decision to make a quilt for. But I mean, at the same time, you might have that situation where it's like, okay, you've made enough quilts to cuddle with and now you're looking for a challenge. Well, that would be a cool challenge, particularly if you don't have hanging space in your house. If you don't have wall hanging space, that would be the next style of quilt. A wall hanging would be designed specifically to hang on a wall and it would be designed purely for artistic you know, expression to, to showcase your skill as a quilter. It would be quilted more densely in general because you would be wanting to add texture, add extra design with the quilting. You would be wanting to add, um, to make it stiffer intentionally because then it hangs better on the wall. You know, a soft drapey quilt, it is soft and drapey and it's gonna probably not, it's not, it's just not gonna hang all that well on a wall, but when you quilt more densely overall, it does hang better and it does hang more straight and square, you know, um, and, and not have like a wobbly bottom edge and stuff like that. So that kind of, most people that aren't quilters wouldn't even notice something like that. So it's kind of, you know, again, esoteric, but a quilter, when we put a quilt on a wall, we want it to hang straight and square like a painting right? So that would be a wall hanging. It would be specifically designed to fill up a space on your wall. Like I'm wanting to put one on this wall right here behind me, uh, but I need it. I had one, I, had, I have had quilts here, but my cat likes to set right here and he gets cat hair all over it. So I want to make another quilt that's higher that only comes to like right here. So that way his cat hair won't get on it. <laughs> so, you know, it's looking at the spaces in your house and saying, okay, I want a 36 by 45 inch quilt to go in that area. And I want it to look like this. And it's looking specifically to fill your home with beautiful quilts and your artistic expression. And I think that's a very powerful way to make quilts. It's, it's wonderful and it showcases your art in an amazing way, your skill in an amazing way. It is a more time consuming form of quilting though because it requires more time, more skill. Um, usually this is when we start getting into that intense applique stuff, which is more time consuming. And then more quilting means more time. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. But basically the purpose of the quilt really will determine how long you're mucking around with it. A bed quilt does not need to be quilted densely. In fact, actually, the more you quilt it, the worse it gets. You know, it's going to get stiffer the more quilting you put into it. So a bed quilt or a throw quilt, you need minimal quilting. A, um, a wall hanging or a bed spread can have more quilting, but that's going to take more time. And then a show quilt, of course, needs to be stitched to death and back again. That's just the way it happens, right guys? This is just, this is just what wins shows, okay? I, I, don't, I don't make the rules, I just relate them to you. <laughs> so that's another thing to think about. What is the purpose of the quilt? Where is it gonna go in your home? What are you gonna do with it? And I should also add maybe baby quilt is, a, is another category too. It is similar to a bed quilt or a throw quilt. It needs to be quilted uh, less densely it needs to be quilted enough though that it can take the washing. So you can, you can do a little bit more stitching on a baby quilt because you're gonna wash that quilt a lot, right? 100 plus times in the first year at least, right? So I think a baby quilt, and then it's also going to come into that category because it's smaller, it's gonna be faster. Even though you put more quilting into it, it's gonna be smaller, so it will be a faster project. So those are all things to think about. What's the purpose? Where is it gonna go? How much quilting does it need? Okay. Size. This gets right back into what's it for? If it is a king size quilt, guys, you're going to be mucking around with that thing for a long time. I'm just saying, I've been working on a king size quilt, the Friendship Sampler, all year. <laughs> Actually, longer than that. It's been a year and a half that I have been messing around with that quilt. So king size quilts are beasts and they take a lot of time. I mean, just the sheer amount of fabric to, you know, yardage wise or pre-cut wise, cutting up the sheer amount of fabric to cover, what is it, 108, 106 inches? It's a lot of fabric. That is a lot of yardage. And yeah, 
that that takes time in and of itself. Piecing the quilt top takes time and then quilting that, and especially if you're quilting it on a home sewing machine. Uh, and we'll get into the style of quilting next, but let's get back to size of quilt. Kings are gonna be your absolute most time consuming. Coming back from that, you can pretty much stair step it down. Anything smaller than a king is going to take less time, right? Uh, baby quilts are gonna be the absolute fastest. Wall hangings, I mean, if it's a small wall hanging, I could probably knock something like that out faster than a, even a baby quilt, but I mean, it really depends on the style and design. Get back to construction. Is it pieced or is it appliqued, right? If it's appliqued, even if it's a small wall hanging, I could probably, you know, I know I could piece and quilt something densely faster than I could applique and quilt something densely, okay? So it's, these things start to overlap, definitely. You know, not only the purpose, not only the construction technique, but also the size. A king-sized, pieced, with pre-cuts quilt, those three things, is going to take less time than a show quilt made from yardage with a combination of applique and super dense quilting. All right, so that would be a monster that I would expect to work on for years. King size pieced from pre-cuts minimally quilted, I wouldn't expect to work on something like that that long, maybe six months, okay? So these, it's a sliding scale, okay? understand that you know this is a little bit it is nuanced and, and there's so many different factors here but you kind of have to start adding these things up and going okay that's how much time that's going to take that's you know all of those things combined together is going to result in a, in a little bit more of a time consuming quilt than this other thing and then you can start budgeting your time wisely right okay and so now style of quilting, meaning the machine that you're gonna be quilting on. So this is one of those things that I think is really interesting about quilting is that certain styles of quilting are faster on a home sewing machine, depending on the size of the quilt. The bigger the quilt gets, the harder physically it starts to feel and so then that starts to add more time to the quilting because you know when you start to get achy shoulders and achy back and achy arms, you don't wanna work on it. So you've gotta factor that in. You know, your general feeling about working on it is going to color how, how often you go, okay, yeah, I wanna go tackle that arm wrestle that quilt in my machine, you know, that kind of mentality. So that can affect things. Um, so straight line quilting, for just for an example, on a home sewing machine with a walking foot is going to be slow because a walking foot is slow. But let's say that was on a baby quilt, that's not gonna be that bad. You know, particularly if you're quilting that open, like let's say quilt straight lines every four inches, four inches horizontal, four inches vertical, that's not actually gonna take that much time because the quilt is gonna feed through the machine because you're using the machine's feed dogs, you're using the walking foot. So that should go fairly fast. You should be able to quilt a baby quilt on a home sewing machine in a matter of days or weeks, depending on how much time you have for quilting every day, okay? Now we ramp that up and go back to size. If you take that exact same design, quilting straight lines four inches apart, and you put that on a king, well, you can pretty much just say, okay, how many of those baby quilts can fit into that king size quilt? Well, if six baby quilts of that size can fit inside that king size quilt, well, then you can just multiply the amount of time it took from one thing to quilt the other thing. And then also you have to factor in, like I said, achy shoulders, achy arms. It just, it is an arm wrestling match to be continually manipulating the quilt through the arm of the machine. So... The style of quilting, the type of machine that you use is going to affect how much time your project takes. And this is, I think, one of the main reasons why we end up with a backlog of quilt tops and not finished quilted quilts. Because the quilting is the crucible that it, it's time consuming, it's hard, it's hard on a home sewing machine, 
Um, it's expensive if we have that, if we send out all of our quilt tops and have them long arm quilted, that adds up really quickly. I mean, you're talking $100 to and up to get your quilt quilted depending on the size, right? Uh, so that adds a factor that I think is, is the thing that is stopping a lot of quilters from getting their quilts done is just the quilting is the hardest part and it takes more time. It is a different skill set from piecing and applique. And I find a lot of quilters get out of whack with their skills. So, you know, piece the top, piece the top, piece the top, your skills for piecing go up. If you don't quilt those tops at, right after you piece them, meaning you quilt everything that you make, then your quilting still, skill stays at the bottom. So it's like a balancing act. You know, you're, you're continually getting better and better and better at piecing, then you might start getting into applique and making really intense, crazy, beautiful quilt tops. But if your quilting skills stay down here at the very, very bottom, very low, you're not gonna wanna take one of those fabulous quilt tops and then go quilt it with your beginner level quilting. You're just not gonna want, you're not gonna feel comfortable with that. That's gonna be terrifying. It's gonna be awful when you see ugly stitches on your quilt. And yes, there are ugly stitches on your quilt. I'm the first person to tell you that. The whole beginning free motion quilting aspect of, of quilting on a home sewing machine is traumatic. <laughs> it's ugly, guys. It's not any fun, but you've got to get through those ugly stitches in order to find the good looking stitches. And how much time that takes depends entirely on how much time you're willing to put into it and how many quilts you're willing to sacrifice on the altar of learning how to do it right? Um, so this would be definitely a situation of putting yourself in jail, of saying, I pieced this beginner level quilt, now I'm going to make myself quilt it so that these skills stay on the same level so that I progress naturally with every quilt that I make. I'm not allowed to just fold that up and put it away. I have to go quilt it. Quilt as you go is an, an option and I should have added that as another construction technique although it's it's tricky and I would go on ahead and say quilt as you go is always more time consuming it is not as easy as just piecing your blocks and then the idea of piecing your blocks separately and then putting them together at the end and keeping it smaller and manageable on your home sewing machine the idea behind that is you would think oh that's going to save me time no, it will not save you time. It will save you achy shoulders and an achy back because it's gonna be smaller and that might feel easier, but quilt as you go is complex because you've gotta then figure out how those blocks are gonna go together and create a finished quilt that's not gonna fall apart, right? My first quilt actually was quilt as you go, so I, stitched nine patch blocks. I stitched them in the ditch. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and each of them, I kind of made a checkerboard on the back. And then I went to go put them together. And it was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea how this is going to go together. I ended up having to rip out some quilting stitches in order to have a little bit of edge on the blocks. I kind of piece the blocks together, kind of. I mean, and some of that quilting is coming out now because I didn't know how to secure it. Uh, so I kind of pieced the blocks together, but then the back, getting those seam allowances to do, and then I was like, am I gonna have to hand stitch all this stuff down? That's gonna be so time consuming. So I just zigzagged over it. I just zigzag stitched right over the seams. And the back, you know, looks pretty bad um, because they're basically kind of folded one fabric over the other and then I stitched straight down through the middle and zigzagged it and the zigzag shows up on both sides. So it looks, yeah, pretty bad. Um, it's held together for 14 years, but there's definitely some wear and tear here. I'm seeing some holes, you know, there's a hole right there. Um, some of the fabrics bled because this was before I pre-washed my fabrics, but the piecing and quilting of the blocks on this quilt was actually pretty speedy. I remember that taking very little time, very little frustration. When I went to start putting those blocks together, all of a sudden this project became an animal. And it was like, I hate this, this is, this is awful. So that is the double-edged sword of Quilt As You Go. You have a fair warning right now 
It might seem easy. It kind of lures you in like a monster. You know, it might seem easy at the beginning. You piece it, you know, you quilt it separately, but the second that you start putting all that stuff together, it can become a beast, okay? And that's why I teach a very specific quilt as you go technique with binding strips. And I love that technique. It is not what I did with this first quilt at all. It took years to come up with that technique. You can find the tutorial at leahday.com slash Q-A-Y-G. That's for quilt as you go. Um, and that will guide you through my method. And I did a super size quilt block for that video. So you can see it will work on any size quilt block. I've done blocks as small as four inches. I've done blocks as big as 26. Actually, I think that was closer to 30 inches. So huge blocks, tiny blocks, it doesn't matter. You will end up with binding strips on the front and the back, half inch binding. It looks fine, get over it, trust me. Every other technique that I have tried that resulted in no binding strips ended up with bulky seam allowances on the back and a big giant headache as far as getting those flat and actually making it make sense. So you don't want to go there. I'm still, I'm still working on developing a quilt as you go technique that results in box, blocks both butted together and wider sashing, but that's a few years down the road. It requires a lot of, of, of very careful technical planning and design in order to figure out how to make things go together consistently and not end up with like spaces with no batting. That's a real challenge with quilt as you go, issues like that. Anyway, that's a whole other tangent for another day. But basically, yeah, quilt as you go is good, but quilt as you go can be more time consuming than you possibly expect. So I would go into any sort of quilt as you go project, understanding that you can time yourself on the blocks, you can time yourself piecing or appliqueing or quilting the blocks and understand how much time that's gonna take. You need to go on ahead and over budget the time for putting that together, over budget. Go on ahead and think, okay, well maybe I can get that done in a couple days. Go on ahead and triple that. So a couple days will take it to two weeks to put it together. And that is, I think, I think that's a good estimation, okay? Uh, depending, of course, on how much time you have for quilting every day. Um, okay, and so, yeah, home sewing machine quilting is, more, is, is slower. It is a slower form of quilting because you are making fine, movements with your hands. You are physically pushing the quilt over the tabletop. Uh, and I found even when I was working on a table mounted long arm, so a high speed, bigger machine set in a table. Okay, so the machine was not moving, it was stationary. Even there, I had to be very careful about my speed because no matter how, like the machine was overpowered basically for what I was using it for because no matter how fast I moved my hands, I could never come close to the speed that the machine could go. I just can't physically move my hands that fast and still have decent looking stitches, right? And so free motion quilting, when you're pushing something physically, it's going to be slower because you're making that movement and pushing against the table and it's a large, I think gravity comes into play, the drag of the quilt comes into play, even when you use a clamping system, even when you, you know, all the bells and whistles and stuff that, that I added over the years, it's going to be slower. And I say that because when I switch to a long arm on a frame, so that is the machine moves, okay, the quilt stays still, it's so much faster because the machine is moving with the slightest push, so less physical effort, with the slightest push, you're making it go, you're making it form stitches. You don't have to do the balancing ratio of speed and movement the way you have to on a home sewing machine or a table mounted longer. I'm, of course, if you have a stitch regulator, and I, I have a, a different feelings about stitch regulators on those styles of machines. But basically I find the stitch regulator on my long arm on a frame is awesome. It works solidly. It keeps my stitches nice and tiny the way I like them to look, no matter how fast I go, unless I go too fast. Uh, but pretty much if I stay within that sweet spot range on the long arm, my stitches stay the same size and same shape. They're consistent. So I don't have to do that 
you know, fuss and fight and learning curve to make consistent size stitches. That's the biggest hurdle with learning free motion quilting. Like I said, it's ugly at the beginning. It looks terrible at the beginning. That's a large reason why, because you're doing two things. You're three things, actually. You're pushing the quilt under the needle on a home sewing machine. You're operating the machine. That's the needle going up and down and that's pressing with your foot on the foot pedal, okay? So you're doing this and you're doing this <laughs> and you're thinking of a design to stitch on your quilt and that is three things. It can make your head explode, right? So it's not always, it's, it's definitely not pretty in the beginning until the speed movement thing, it's like riding a bicycle. You know, the first time you get on a bicycle, you don't know how to balance. You know, it's a balancey kind of thing until you practice enough where that balancey thing becomes second nature. Thinking of the design is almost too much. That's why, you know, when I'm talking to beginners, my number one piece of advice is stick with really simple shapes. You know, just simple curving lines is a perfectly fine design to start with for several quilts because it's too overwhelming to think of much more than that, you know. Go with what's simple, and like I said, if you start with those simple quilts, your beginner quilt, quilted with your beginner level stitches, they go together. You know, if you quilt your own quilts from the beginning, then you never get your skills out of whack. So there's lots of options if you're like, well, I have a home sewing machine, it's got a small harp, you know, I like walking foot quilting, but it's slow. You know, it is starting to cause some physical issues. Look into your local area about renting time on a long arm. It's becoming a lot more common than it was when I started quilting in 2005. Uh, yeah, I mean, long arms weren't even really a thing in 2005. Um, and you know, now, 2019, I I, there are two long arm dealers within driving distance, like less than an hour away from my home with long arms to rent time on. And that's considerable. I don't live in a metropolitan area. <laughs> you know, I live in the boonies. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that that is available that close to me tells me that this is a lot more widespread. Uh, and so just look around and see what's available for you. Rent time, you know, you'll probably have to take a class to get certified to use the long arm. And that's just gonna teach you the basics of long arm quilting and not to break the machine, cause that would obviously irritate everyone at the dealership. So, you know, you got to take that class just to learn how to use the long arm, how to load it, uh, how to change the bobbins, how to thread it, all that good stuff. And then, then you'll be able to rent time on the long arm and be able to come in, load your quilt on, and most likely you'd be able to quilt it in a day, you know? And most rental long arms that I've seen are set up at king sized. So you could come in with a king size quilt and let's say you did something really simple, straight lines, four inches apart, you will have that quilt quilted in a day. And I can say that because I did that exact thing. I, uh, I had a, uh, it was a queen size quilt, it was huge. And it was for um, quilt market. I had to have it done, bound, shipped in one day. <laughs> there was no way I was gonna be able to meet that deadline uh, with my home sewing machine. There was just absolutely no way. So I rented time on the long arm. I did straight lines going in one direction. I took it off the machine and um, repenned my, and that was when I was using zippers, but I repenned it and got it back on the long arm again. And I did wavy lines going in the other direction, nice and wide apart. It was a perfect quilting design. It was super, super simple. It got it together, it got it finished, and it was done in a day. Okay, so I really feel like this is something to think about and, and experiment with. If you've got lots of quilt tops stacked up, you know, and you can't think of really sending all of those out to be quilted by somebody else, really consider renting time or learning more about long arm quilting because that will be a faster way to quilt it and less physical kind of stuff on your body. The other alternative is to just really push yourself to master free motion quilting, walking foot quilting, and ruler foot quilting on your home sewing machine. You gotta make yourself do it. You know, if you've got a backlog of quilts, a quilt tops, and none of them are done, you need to stop buying more fabric and piecing more quilt tops. I mean, I know that that probably is what makes you very, very happy, 
but you've got to do something about that and decide to stop making more UFOs because that's what all of that is and start getting serious about turning those into finished quilts and bite the bullet, deal with the ugly stitches, understand that you're gonna put beginner level stitches on pretty advanced quilts and you're gonna to have to be okay with that. They might go from quilts that you, you know, prized and on, you know, were just like, oh man, that, you know, that's such a gorgeous quilt. I want to give that to so-and-so. And now you might look at it after you quilt it with your beginner stitches and be like, I wouldn't want anyone to see that. And that's okay. You know, that's okay to say that. And it's okay to donate those quilts to charity. But I'm being honest because this is hard. You know, uh, I've talked and shared and helped many, many people learn about free motion quilting. And I have a stack of practice sandwiches filled to the brim of ugly stitches. The like normal way that it looks whenever you are starting free motion quilting. And it is Frankenstein scary because you're, you don't have the ratio of hand movement to uh, speed of your machine. You can't think of the design fast enough. You're constantly stopping and starting and, you know, and then the movement too is very herky jerky. So you might be trying to stitch a teardrop shape and it ends up looking more like an amoeba and that's normal. It's not abnormal to have problems when you first start free motion quilting. It's not abnormal to have skip stitches and eyelashes and bird's nest and to suddenly start worrying that your machine has just broken. That's normal guys. And this is why there's, you know, a lot of quilters that just never learn how to free motion quilt and never learn how to quilt their own quilts on their home sewing machine because it's really hard. Okay. I'm just being honest. I hope, hope you hope you don't mind <laughs> as I am being completely honest. Okay. So let's talk about the quilting style because, okay, we, we covered the style of construction method. So piecing applique whole cloth show quilt. We talked about the machine or the, that you use to quilt it. So home sewing machine is slower than long arm quilting. Okay. Now let's talk about the quilting style. And this is something I talk ab about a lot in my How Do I Quilt This series uh, for the uh, Quilt Friends Club. And this is how much quilting you put on a quilt and how that quilting is designed to work really will change how much time you're, you're messing around with it. So stitching in the ditch or stitching in the ditch is more time consuming because you have to stay right in the ditch. I'd say an alternative that would be faster would be echo ditching, where instead of stitching right in that little seam right between the blocks, instead you just, you know, bun, bunch over a half of an inch or a quarter of an inch and you stitch right along the edge. And then it's less noticeable when you're, you kind of wiggle a little bit because everybody naturally wiggles, right? So um, stitching straight lines across your quilt is a perfectly fine, solid way of getting your quilt quilted. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. That is how my grandmothers and great grandmothers quilted their quilts. And I love those quilts and they are done and finished and I cuddled with them my entire life. So. I'm telling you right now, straight lines across your quilt, going in one direction, going in the other direction, within the rating of your batting, so that's what your batting will say, quilting up to five inches, then that means straight lines quilted four inches apart on your quilt is plenty of quilting to get it done, get the job done, and the batting will not shift in the middle of the quilt. That's as, that's as much quilting as your quilt needs. It's not dependent upon the style when you're wanting to quilt a bed quilt or a throw quilt. It's dependent upon how much quilting your batting needs so it doesn't shift within the quilt, right? So minimal quilting is fine. Why stitch it more when you want it to be soft and cuddly? Why stitch it more when that's gonna take more time and gonna be an arm wrestling match if you're doing it on your home sewing machine? Why stitch it more when you don't need to, right? So if it's a bed quilt, if, it ha you know, if, uh, if you are quilting on your home sewing machine, look for a batting with an extremely high rating. So quilting up to, you can find battings. Quilter's Dream has great battings and they are quilting up to 10 inches. Some of them are quilting up to 12 inches. So a, a quilting up to 12 inch batting would allow you to get away with lines stitched 
11 inches apart. You want to go within that rating, right? So that way you're not pushing it. So 11 inch lines spaced apart. That is some huge, huge, that, that's bigger than these blocks on this quilt. So it would be like, here's a line and then way down here's a line. You know, minimal quilting guys. I, it, you know, when we see these quilts at show, this is kind of, this is kind of the, why we run away with this idea that our quilts need more quilting and we kind of beat them to death with it is that we go to shows and we see this fantastic, amazing quilting that's super, super dense and intense and crazy. And then we go home and we think, oh, I need to do that to my bed quilts. No, they're two different things. It's a cat and a dog. I mean, they're two different things. A show quilt is meant to be a wall hanging that is meant to be over the top, fantastic, knock your socks off. A bed quilt is meant to be soft, cuddly and fast to finish so you can actually use it and enjoy it in your lifetime, right? <laughs> so that's what I really want to encourage you to do. Don't quilt it to death. If it's meant to be soft and cuddly, make sure it stays soft and cuddly. And I'm kind of ranting about this a little bit because I actually made a really major mistake with a quilt I made for a friend of mine. Uh, I, I thought I was making it better and I was actually making it worse. Uh, and it was one of the first major quilts that I quilted on my long arm and it ended up coming out. I've used, it was a, it was a combination of too thick of a batting and using minky on the back, which can tend to stiffen things if you quilt it too densely. Uh, and so the finished quilt didn't feel like a cuddly throw. It wasn't, it wasn't soft and drapey enough to be comfortable to cuddle up with on the couch. And so she ended up hanging it on her wall and that was not the purpose of it. I really wanted it to, I really wanted it to hug her and it didn't do that because I beat it to death with too much quilting. And that was a waste of my time, right? I ruined the quilt basically. I ruined the purpose of the quilt that I was making for my friend because I quilted too much on it, which is a waste of my time. I should have quilted it much more open then it would have done what I wanted it to do for her. It would, have, it would have hugged her, it would have comforted her. She was very sick and, and it didn't end up doing that. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of beating this in because I feel frustrated even now about that particular quilt. Like, I, I can't believe that I made that mistake. And it was really one of those, it was at the, my turning point from going from a home sewing machine quilter and thinking of like, oh, beat it to death with texture to more of a long arm quilter where the mentality is, quilt it as much as it needs and then let it go, right? And, and, and it, it was really quilted too much. It was quilted way too much. Um, another style of quilting, this is for a quilt where you wanna put a little bit more time into it, uh, where the purpose is not for a cuddly bed quilt. The purpose is for like that bed spread where it's more decorative, a tablecloth quilt, which is what this is. Uh, yeah, I have another quilt here. This is uh, my uh, heart medallion quilt. And you can find videos on this. Unfortunately, the fabric is not available anymore, but you can still find videos on this and you can see how to quilt it, um, how to do this really cool border that I did. And this is what I call section quilting. So basically, the blocks were quilted one way. So one design of the blocks and I basically just stitched the cute little heart medallion designs in the blocks. And then I did a different design in the sashing. Okay. And then I did a different design in the border. So I, this is in, in long arm quilting terms, this is custom quilting. And I call it section quilting because to me it's like every section gets a different design or every section gets its own unique thing. So for me, I like that term better, but custom quilting is more common in the long arm quilting world. So, you know, each section gets its own unique design and that really adds more, it honors the quilt, the, the piecing more. So yeah, if you've gotten a high level of skill with your piecing, then obviously you would want to section quilt that quilt if the purpose was for a more of a decoration, if it's a wall hanging, if it's a tablecloth quilt, if it's a bedspread and you want it to be quilted a little bit more densely, then you would choose section quilting. But here's the thing about section quilting, guys. That style of quilting, about custom quilting, each area gets a different design that requires more thought more planning, more decision-making. More decisions means more time. I'm promising you that. 
It always means more time because then you have to stop and go, okay, what design am I going to put here? Okay, I think it's going to be that one. That takes time. And when I'm exhausted on a project, I can't make up my mind. I just, I lose all ability to make decisions. I need someone to say, put circles there, Leah. Put straight lines there, Leah. You know, I need somebody to tell. And oftentimes I'll pull Josh in and be like, tell me what to quilt here. I don't know. <laughs> so for me, I, I have learned that I have to be really careful to get a plan drawn and, and planned from the beginning before I dig into a quilt. Because as I, I dig into it, I, I kind of run out of energy on it. And when I run out of energy to a certain level, I can't make decisions anymore. And then that's when a, a project gets stuck for me because I, if I can't make a decision on it, then that means it can't go anywhere. Because so many things are dependent upon choose this or this. You know, choose between this thread color and that thread color. Choose between this design and that design. Choose between 500 different designs. That's how many designs I've shared. So, I mean, it, it really can get overwhelming. And, you know, it's called the paradox of choice for a reason. When we have too many choices, it can be really hard to decide on one thing and be really happy about that one thing. So section quilting is gorgeous, but it's going to be more time consuming. Number one, because every time you, like, let's say you stitch a block, you use one design like in the uh, shapes of the block. So for example, uh, all the sunshine surprise blocks that we did, that was a quilt along we did a couple years ago. I did different designs, you know, in the triangles and stuff. And then I did a different design in the background. Well, that was section quilting. That was, those blocks were pretty slow. It would take me upwards of an hour to quilt each one of them. Okay. And that was just the quilting. That wasn't the piecing, right? So section quilting can slow you down. When you add thread color changes, that will slow you down even more. So if you say, okay, all of the triangles are going to be blue and all of the, uh, the background is gonna be quilted in white. Yeah, you have to quilt the triangles first and then you've gotta change thread and change bobbins and wind all of that stuff to start with and then change all of that out and rethread your machine and then go quilt the other one. And that doesn't sound like a very big deal, but let's say you decide on seven color changes across a block. That is seven times you're going to be changing your bobbin. Seven times you're going to be rethreading your machine. And here's the thing that I know about color changes. This comes way back to whenever I sewed garments for a living. I did that for a year and a half right after Josh and I got married. And I learned so many very nuanced things about time management when it came to sewing because I had to get through 60 garments per week. So I learned everything there was to learn about sewing very fast, high speed. I mean, it was pedal to the metal, like zooming things through my serger as fast as I possibly could because the alternative was I would not get my work done in a week, right? So one thing I learned was every time I had to change out thread colors, that was a distraction. It was a distraction where, you know, I don't know why, but it, it presented a stop and a start. And, and this is something that I've read about with um, like product development and kind of like it's more of a businessy kind of thing, but finish lines represent a stop and then you have to restart. And that can be a moment where you just say, all right, I'm gonna stop for the day. And when you stop for the day, that's it. And then it might be several days before you go back and change that bobbin thread and rethread that machine. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's like that represents a convenient place to stop and then you might not restart for several more days. So I am very suspicious of bobbin thread changes, color changes for that reason, because I know myself well. And I know that number one, I'll make excuses to not wind all the bobbins at the beginning, which is what I should do. Then when the thread color change comes, it's like, oh, I've got to go wind bobbins, you know, and then I'm lazy about it. And then it's something about that stop, rethread, unless I'm in the zone, it's like, quickly, let's do it. You know, I can't wait to see this color on the quilt, you know, unless I'm in the zone with it, I oftentimes will make an excuse and that will be it for the day. And then it might be several days or weeks before I go back to that quilt and get back to quilting. And this is one thing a lot of my quilts, like this one actually here on my lap, it was quilted entirely in white. 
And there's a reason why I started doing that. Number one, I, I started the habit of quilting only in white with the Free Motion Quilting Project because I needed high contrast so you guys could see my stitches in videos, right? And then it, that just started being what I saw in quilting so much that became the only thing I liked. I really didn't like it when my quilting stitches uh, matched, especially, I don't like it at all when my quilting stitches match with the, the fabric color because then what's the point? You can't see it unless your face is like right up on it. So I started quilting everything in white and then it became my thing to where I almost don't like a quilt if it's quilted with matching thread or even a slight contrast. I really like to see white stitches on my quilts, right? And it also saves me a lot of time. I wind 50 bobbins, <laughs> that's an exaggeration, but I will wind 10, 20 bobbins at once. And then all I have to do is just change out the spool because I will run out of spools of white thread and you know, and then popping in new bobbins, and then I don't have to worry about thread color changes, right? I, I know that sounds crazy, and a lot of people really want blended colors, you know, the same color thread on the same color fabric. Number one, it's like quilting in the dark. You can't see what you're doing, and if you can't see what you're doing, you're not gonna be improving. You're not gonna be improving your quilting ability if you contrast thread on the back of a quilt Trust me, every time that machine makes a bad noise and garbles, you're gonna be there picking that out, figuring out what went wrong with your machine, re-threading it and getting started back again and getting that nasty bird's nest off the back of your quilt. The quilt that I have here, this is that, uh, that uh, heart medallion quilt. It has a dark kind of medium, well I should say medium, medium purple backing and you can see those white stitches, right? If I had a bird's nest here, you would be able to see it. And so when you contrast even your backing with your thread color, it ramps up your need to be persnickety about the quilting and to, and to own up to it, basically. You can't just keep stitching after your machine makes a bad noise and gags on you. You've got to go deal with that. A lot of quilters just keep on stitching. You've got to stop and go deal with that. That is a thread break. That is a point of of uh, weakness in your quilt. That is a point that uh, the thread's shredded and it, it's ugly. Why leave that in your quilt, right? It's just a habit to get into, to go own the mistake, pick it out and get back on track. I don't rip anything else these days. If I make a mistake on my quilt, I keep on going. But if it makes a bad noise and I know there's a bird's nest on the back of the quilt, that always gets picked out because it just looks terrible. And it's gonna come out eventually anyway. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna do its own like, you know, untangly thing in the washing machine. And then it'll be big, long, nasty thread tails all over the place. So you've gotta stop and pick that out. So, long tangent, but basically, <laughs> uh, all over quilting, let's say straight lines, stippling, any all over quilting style design is gonna be your fastest quilting style. Okay, whether you do it on a home sewing machine, a long arm, any kind of machine, that's gonna be the fastest quilting style because you are ignoring the piecing, you are ignoring the applique, you are ignoring whatever is on that quilt and you're saying, this is utilitarian, I'm just getting it done. And that is perfectly fine. I'm giving you permission. If that is what the purpose of your quilt is for a bed quilt, throw quilt, baby quilt, if it's the purpose is just to cuddle with it on the couch, do not beat it to death with quilting. Straight lines over it and be done and move on to the next one, right? If it is a tablecloth, a wall hanging, something super special, a bedspread, and you want it to be stiffer and you don't want it to hug you when you curl up with it, then you can put more quilting into it. That's section quilting or custom quilting. Understand it's gonna take more time. If you change those thread colors, it's gonna take more time. If you get nitpicky about every little thing and, and pick out your mistakes, it's gonna take more time and that's okay. We put as much time into a project as it deserves, meaning how meaningful it is. If I'm gonna put a quilt on my wall and look at it every day, yeah, I'm gonna be pretty picky about how it's gonna look because I'm gonna be looking at that thing every day, right? I wanna make sure that it's going to be my style and it's going to make me happy to see it there, you know? Uh, okay. Last style would be show quilting without saying, I don't have to really go into it. Really, really, really time consuming. Super dense quilting. 
you know, basically stitching where the texture becomes the quilting design. I'm holding up my whole cloth quilt again here, guys. Very time consuming. I, and I can't really even estimate how much time I've got left on this little piece. Um, it took years to get to this stage. This was a little test piece that I made for Duchess Reigns. And I think I started that in 2012. So this started in 2012 and I have no estimation on how much time finishing that border will take. And then, you know, binding it of course will be easy, but um, just being it, you know, quilting densely through that border, even though most of it's filled with feathers, this could take another, you know, several months, depending on how much time I put into it. Now, if I, if I put in a regular 15 to 20 minutes a day on that piece, yeah, it's going to get done. But it, you know, right now it's in, you know, it, I pulled it out of a drawer before it was here with me on the couch today. So it's not obviously not going anywhere in the bottom of my drawer. It's not, it's not going to get any work on it uh, there. So getting it out and getting it on the machine is the first step, right? How much time I put into it every day is the next step. And this really goes in perfectly for our next part of this whole time estimation thing. And that is how much time do you have to quilt every day? Is it 15 minutes? Is it an hour? You know, right now, starting today, time yourself and see how much time you can fit into your day and not like, don't try and maximize it. Just minute, you know, how much natural time, not if you like rush through dinner or snap at your kids or like, Fin for yourselves, I'm gonna go quilt. You know, that's not realistic. It's not sustainable. Whenever I pull that kind of stuff, I mean, I can maybe get away with it if I have major deadlines and stuff. I could maybe get away with it for a month. And those deadlines have gotta be super, super, super special. And this is why I don't really quilt to deadlines anymore because I hate that. Um, but I can maybe get away with that with my family for a month. And then they're just kind of sick of it. And it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> no, You're, go make dinner. <laughs> Let's, let's enjoy ourselves. Like, what is the point of living life if we don't enjoy ourselves together, right? Um, so I would say don't try and maximize your time because that just makes it torture and not any fun. Uh, instead, how much natural time do you have for quilting in your craft without diminishing anything else that you're already doing? For me, that's about 15 minutes a day. And that's the time that I get to do my little hand stitching on the couch. Um, and, and that's the time that I say is like for me, I'm not doing something for my business. I'm not filming that. I'm not, I'm not doing anything like that. This is my time to do what I want. And it's either hand stitching on the couch or sometimes I'll go downstairs and do some quilting. But that's it, you know? That's as much time as I have every day realistically for quilting. Now, sometimes I can take that 15 minutes and stretch it. You know, it might turn into two silly television shows on Amazon or, you know, some YouTube videos or something. I might stretch that a length of time, but I, I, I'm, I'm saying this very carefully because I don't want you to feel like you've got to go stop doing something that you love in order to push more time at quilting. Unless, of course, that thing is wasting time with like video games or uh, tr trolling social media. I mean, like there's things that we can do that com is a complete and utter waste of time that me personally, I would rather be quilting, you know? So I have eliminated time wasters. Uh, I don't game anymore. I don't get on Facebook. I don't even get on Instagram hardly anymore, guys, because I noticed that those things and Pinterest especially, it's like when I turn on those apps, it's like my brain just gets hijacked and then it's an hour later and I just lost all my time for quilting, right? So eliminate your time wasters as you also dig into um, how much time you have for quilting and, and, and measure that amount of time through the entire week and just see how much time you've got. And that's going to really help you say, okay, well, I've got an hour for quilting every day and that means I've got seven hours a week and you know, I love this. And yeah, I want to take on that harder project that's going to take more time that, you know, it might take five hours to, to piece that crazy Baltimore album block, you know, or applique it and, and put it all together. But that would be a value for your time because you're building skill and learning something new. If you have 15 minutes a day and this is after, you know, a crazy hectic work day and quilting is what you do to relax and chill out, 
then piecing, you know, stick with piecing, stick with simple designs that aren't super stressful and, you know, make the quilts that you want to make basically, but don't bite off too much because you're going to end up basically any project that you take on that is more complicated is going to end up taking you months and months longer because you just don't have that much time to put into it. That's what, that's that my, you know, my situation right now is I don't really take on huge, crazy projects anymore because I know that I will end up, they'll end up getting stagnated or stuck. And I don't want that floating around my house. So, you know, the goddess quilts that I have been making more recently have shrunk in size. You know, instead of making something that's 60 inches wide, which I love huge quilts, they're just not, they're not sustainable for me. I can't do that anymore and, and keep the momentum going with the length of time that I have for quilting. And because of that, I've just... I've minimized the size of quilt that I do. So instead of making something 60 inches wide, I make something that's 30 inches wide. It has less impact, but it makes me a lot happier to get it done faster instead of mucking around with it for years. And my last really big goddess quilt, uh, I started it in 2015 and I only finished it in 2018 because basically, you know, it kind of got, it got stuck. I didn't have enough time to devote to it. I got stuck on technique too, and we're gonna get into that. Um, and for various reasons, it stayed folded in the closet, unfinished. I was a little afraid of finishing it too, but basically it was like, I just, I just did not have the time to commit to it. I really didn't. And I, that is so frustrating, but I wanna share with you guys, you know, having over committed on projects before, it's not any fun. So if you don't have that much time for quilting, be honest with yourself about that. Commit to the projects that you find most meaningful and stop buying more stuff that just adds to your plate and makes it more stressful. That's not, you're not doing yourself any favors. And then you have to find places to store that stuff. I mean, I'm, I've been going through my studio continually for the last two years. And I find that, you know, in a large case, I've spent a lot of money on storage units to store all the stuff that I bought that I'm not actually using, but I bought, you know, on impulse or whim or whatever, because the buying was easier and it made me feel creative, but it was, it was a cheap kind of substitute for actually going and quilting. You know, basically instead of going and working on Dream Goddess and getting that quilt done, I went to Hobby Lobby and bought some more fabric or got, you know, got another craft tool or something like that. Or, you know, I, I went off on a tangent of making costumes and stuff and that was fun, but it wasn't actually living up to my highest potential and making the quilt that meant the most to me, right? I hope that makes sense. Okay, so next thing to think about is learning new things. Whenever you are tackling a brand new skill, even if you have already learned something similar, any new technique in a quilt is going to take more time. And this was another reason why I didn't finish Dream Goddess for several years is because I wanted to use a new binding method that I had not used before. And that, uh, it, that alone kind of got that stuck because I was afraid of messing it up. So I didn't want to finish it, so I didn't want to bind it. <laughs> you know, it's like the binding was the thing looming on the horizon that I was resisting. And it was really silly because once I figured it out, it's now one of my favorite binding techniques. It's a faced binding and pulls the edges to the back. And it's really a perfect way to finish wall hangings and, uh, you know, even show quilts. It's a really terrific technique to learn how to do. But my resistance to learn slowed that quilt down. Another example of something like a skill to learn, uh, I have two quilts that need to be framed. I've never framed a quilt before. I've never stuck a quilt in a picture frame. And while that may not seem like much, that has slowed both of those projects down and stopped them from getting out of the drawer and getting finished because I, number one, I didn't even know what size of frame to order. I ended up ordering the wrong size of frame for one of those quilts uh, and then ended up having to order a different one. So, you know, even something as small as buying a picture frame for a quilt can be something that slows it down. As silly as that sounds, it really can. 
a new pe piecing technique, if you're learning how to piece with curves, if you are learning how to do fusible applique, you've never done it before, it's going to slow you down. Uh, and this definitely gets into quilting. If you are learning free motion quilting for the very first time, you are going to go a lot slower on that quilt than you will once you've quilted your fifth free motion quilted quilt. Uh, so understand the first time you do anything, it's going to be the hardest and it's going to be the slowest. It's gonna take a million years. Every time you do it after that, it's going to speed up. But, and, and I really think that you should try and approach projects adding one new thing that's new, unless you're just beginning, which case, you know, it's all huge and overwhelming. But after you kind of get the basics under your belt, add, add one new technique or new skill with every quilt that you make. And then that way you don't get bored you don't stagnate with your quilting and just you know constantly grab pre-cuts and make the same quilt over and over and over again. You're, you're changing your skill, you're building new skill, you're learning new things. But understand that every technique that you learn that's new is going to slow you down. It is going to take more time. So if you're in a hurry, go with what you know. You know, do traditional straight seam piecing. Go with what you know, what you know will be fast. Keep that quilting really big, really open, straight lines, 11 inches apart. It's A-OK. -okay. There is nothing wrong with that. That will result in a big, soft, cuddly bed quilt that will absolutely, you know, hug you the way that you want it to. When you get bored with that, though, when you're feeling frustrated and just like, eh, I could take this or I could leave this, you get that meh feeling about your quilts, that's a sign that you need to start pushing yourself again and learn new things. Try working with yardage. Try a whole cloth quilt. Try an applique quilt. You know, do something brand new that you have not done before. Challenge yourself to learn free motion quilting. Start custom quilting or section quilting your quilts to add more texture, more interest to the design. And you know, start thinking in terms of not just doing you know, the most open, simple quilting that you can do, start thinking in terms of adding texture and making that quilt more interesting with your quilting design as another design element. It's a, it's a different way of thinking about it. It's no longer just utilitarian stitching the layers together. It's taking that quilt and adding another layer of design and, and, and beautification to that quilt. And that really adds to it. It really, really does. It does take more time though. So understand that. And this is, I think you can take all of this that I've shared today and go through your stack of UFOs and start thinking in terms of, okay, what is the purpose of this? Where is it gonna go? What am I using this for? And you can start to separate your quilts and the quilts that can be quilted super, super fast 11 inch quilting, straight lines apart, you know, that kind of thing can go in one pile and you can slam through those. And then your quilts that are gonna take more time require skills that you need to learn, you know, things that you need to get a handle on, those things can go into another pile. But always, always, this is what I said in the last podcast, go with what means the most to you first. That is always the number one thing. There's no point in working on a project that you don't care about, absolutely no purpose. Okay, last few thoughts on estimating your time. And I think this is really important. And this is gonna take a little bit, definitely a little bit of practice, but I think it's definitely worth it. And that is to time yourself making a block or two and see how much time it takes. This is a great way of knowing how long you're going to be mucking around in a project. And then you can decide, okay, well, it's supposed to be a king size quilt, but I'm only gonna end up making this a baby quilt. You know, you can decide as, you know, as the creator of the quilt, you bought the pattern, but you can decide to only make four blocks. That's okay. You don't have to make 26 blocks or 50 blocks or whatever it calls for. If you decide that you, you know, it takes too much time and you just simply don't like it enough to bother with it. Um, so great example is what I'm working on right now. Uh, like I said, this is a quilt for, that was made from Josh's grandmother's clothing and it's for my mother-in-law. And uh, so I, I can roughly say that I've been working on this double, this is a double wedding ring and it is paper pieced. Uh, so this is a paper pieces pack. I stabilized the clothing. So I was prepping up the fabric 
during the intro of our last podcast episode. And in that amount of time, I took the fabric, I cut it into strips, I penned the corresponding shape to the strip. So this is how I, I cut out my paper pieces and I know how many pieces that I have remaining. Uh, I love doing it this way because I can just grab a, pa a strip pinned strip like this and my needle and thread and I can, I, this, this is all I need to carry this project somewhere. I also need a pair of scissors, but you know, basically I could carry this much and have something to do with my hands if I'm, you know, at a birthday party or something like that and I'm just kind of sitting there bored. <laughs> then I can, I can have some hand stitching to do in the corner. Uh, but basically I time myself and now I ran off, because this is new, I've never done this particular pattern with paper piecing before, I, I kind of thought I was gonna be clever and you know kind of come up with my own way of doing it. I, I didn't like the idea of having to piece it together and then applique it to the quilt and then cut the back of the quilt and then remove the paper pieces. I didn't, I didn't like that. So I thought, oh, maybe I can do it a different way. And so I ran down on my own tangent uh, with one strip of paper pieces just to see if my idea would work didn't end up working. So that was an example of taking more time to learn something new. And I ended up wasting some time with that. I, I ended up fixing it. It's okay. But, you know, I ran down that tangent just to see if I uh, could make it work better or work faster. And I could not. So then I just, you know, decided, okay, I'll just make it the way it's supposed to be made the proper way. And that is, you know, fold the fabric around the paper pieces, stitch around it to baste. And then now I'm piecing those pieces together in order to make my arcs. And, you know, so this is a great example of learning something new can take more time. Uh, so I know two weeks to do one double wedding ring is going to be the highest end of the scale. Like I think all of the rest of them that I make are going to be much, much faster. Also in these last two weeks, I have not had my normal 15 minutes of evening stitching time every evening because I've been working on my book in the evening. I've been doing layout and all that kind of stuff. So for that reason, I, I haven't had my normal amount of time. So I can say those two weeks were abnormal and I think I could definitely get, if I really, you know, buckled down and said, okay, I'm definitely getting my 15 minutes of stitching time in every evening, then I know I would fly through this. So um, whenever I know that it's off, like my time estimation is off like that, and I've had an abnormal week, then that's not really a, an estimation that I'm going to go with. Basically, I'm going to go on ahead and sit down and say, okay, let's start another one and let's do that estimation over again and see if that's gonna hold true or if I'm gonna speed up considerably. So I think that's, that's really a good thing to keep in mind. If you set down a piece of new block and it takes 30 minutes and you know the piecing technique, you've already got everything cut out, it felt pretty simple, pretty easy and wasn't stretching you too much and all the blocks are identical, then you can pretty much estimate that you're either gonna spend 30 minutes or you're probably going to speed up as you piece more blocks. So if it takes 30 minutes and you've got, let's say 10 blocks, well, it's gonna take, a, what, three hours in order to get all of that done, right? So just for an example, if you have a block and it takes an hour to piece it and it's not really you know, pushing you on skill too much, every, all the other blocks are identical, it's all pretty much the same, straight piecing, very simple, uh, then you know you're gonna probably speed up on that. But if it took one hour to piece one block and you've got 10 blocks or 12 blocks to make, then you know how many hours roughly all those blocks are going to take to piece. And then, you know, sashing, binding, borders, all that kind of good stuff, you know, that kind of stuff can take more time. I find borders for me, I slow, I tend to slow down with borders, I really do. So a lot of times I'll, I'll, a project will get stuck for me and I actually have one downstairs right now that is a, an unfinished mostly because I haven't had the time to plan and piece the multiple borders that I want on that quilt. So uh, understand that you know sometimes the design, certain areas of the design can easily get you stuck you need to identify those just so that you're ready for them. You know, now that I've really identified that, that it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a monkey wrench and I really love it. It's a monkey wrench quilt, but it is waiting on me to get my act together 
to go prep up fabric and cut. Basically, I'd like to add three borders to it just to make it really cool. And that's all it's waiting on. And I just really don't particularly enjoy piecing borders. I find it very tedious. Um, it's very slow. It requires most of the table to be cleared off. So I need a lot of space in order to be able to spread the quilt out and press seams and measure it accurately. Uh, so that's a part of the factor too. You know, I have to clean off my table. I have to clean up all my junk. And I, I often don't feel like doing that. <laughs> I really sound like a messy person, don't I? I mean, how many podcast episodes do I make where I'm cleaning? <laughs> I'm cleaning up and I'm using the podcast episode just to, you know, kind of motivate me to tidy. So yeah, I, that is definitely a factor. So uh, understand your idiosyncrasies. I think that's really key, but also start timing yourself. I really think that if you get into the habit of timing yourself with this stuff, you're going to learn so much about yourself, about your habits um, you might find that you're losing, you know, an hour, two hours a day to a video game. And I, we had another podcast episode about the addictive nature of video games. Uh, I was speaking to my friend Luann and, uh, you know, she quit video games this year, you know, cold turkey and said, I'm not going to do this anymore and has opened up so much time in her day and is being able to knock out so many more projects because she's not spending her time in a virtual reality. And, um, and we talked a lot about just how like iPad video games are very different from the console video games that I grew up like. I grew up playing Game Boy and it wasn't a big deal. But uh, I also didn't grow up with television. We didn't have a television in my house growing up. So that my parents bought me the Game Boy largely because I had a two hour bus ride and, you know, and I was allowed to play only pretty much only then. Um, so I think it's very different now and it's very easy to get sucked in and addicted to a video game. And I was addicted to an iPad video game for about a year and a half. And I just basically lost that time and basically just, just burned it up in smoke because I got nothing done during that time that I was playing that game. And it, and it, can, just, it can just eat at your day. It really can. So I, I'd say identify those time wasters, start really paying attention to that. Uh, and if you want to make quilts, you know, understand going into it that it, it's not quick and easy. I mean, that's what I said last in the last podcast. It's not quick and easy. It is slow and time consuming. And it's having that ability to commit to saying, I am going to be looking at these fabrics for the next six months. I am going to be messing around with this for a year, possibly, you know, that's the reality guys. And that's okay. Now, if you've got a quilt that you're like, well, I really want this done. I really want this finished. I really want to enjoy it. I want to use it. I want this on my bed before Christmas. Go rent time on a long arm, you know? Go make that happen by speeding up some element of the process, whether that's buying pre-cuts in order to make the piecing and the cutting faster and simpler, uh, you know, picking a quilt that is all straight seams and traditional piecing, that's going to make it much faster. Um, and then choosing to rent time on a long arm, that's going to make it much faster. That's going to make it doable in that time limit, right? Um, but it's also okay to spend a lot of time on a project too. You know, there's, there's projects that I look back on where it's like, wow, that was, that was something that I carried with me through that time of my life. You know, I feel like, you know, the gaming stuff was a large reason why Dream Goddess didn't get done for so long. Uh, and when I look at that quilt, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not that that makes me happy by any means, but uh, I can look at that quilt and say, you know, that was made during that time of my life where I was wasting a lot of time. And I mean, I'll, I'll never get that time back, but I can look at that quilt and see that lesson there. And, and I really feel like different quilts have, you know, really can kind of, um, you know, it can be that quilt of that year. And you kind of, it makes you remember that, that year and look back on it with fondness. When I look back at certain quilts that I've made, you know, certain quilts that I've given away, 
that I don't see on a regular basis. And then when I, you know, I see a couple quilts at dad's house or something like that, it's like, oh, you know, that takes me back to when James was little, when I made that quilt, you know, or that takes me back when we first moved into the house and I made a big, huge quilt to cover one wall of our house because the wall was really ugly and I didn't want to paint it. So I just covered the whole wall with a big giant quilt. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really can take you back when you only have a handful of projects and they're very special, very meaningful projects, then they stand out in your mind and memory in a very different way. And they can become kind of a touchstone to the past in a very special way. When you've got 50 projects and they're all, you know, kind of like trinkets and you could give or take and it's kind of meh feeling about all of them, then they don't really matter the same way. And they're not going to really stand out. You're not going to be able to remember, like, did I, did I make that, you know, the year my daughter was having a baby or did I make that the year my son was going to college? You know, it kind of, it's not, it's not going to hold the same level of meaning for you if it all kind of looks the same or if it all kind of meshes together. And so for that reason, I don't think, trying to finish tons and tons of projects is a good thing. You know, I don't, I don't think that's a positive. Um, when I, I've been, I've been goal setting a lot lately and really think about the projects that I have in progress, the quilt tops that I've got in my home, you know, and I have, I am, I am a volume creator guys. <laughs> you know, I can sit down and be like, all right, we're going to make another 300 designs. And, you know, I can start making lists and knocking, you know, scratching things off my list and that kind of thing. And I realized that I really have to step back and stop doing that, even though that's, that's what's easy for me. That's what's easy. I have to stop doing that and do what's hard. And the hard thing for me is focusing on one thing at a time, only one, and carrying it through from beginning to middle to end. A lot of times I have six different projects in progress all these balls in the air, every surface of my house gets completely cluttered. I get very distracted and stressed out because of that. And then nothing is any fun to work on and it's all chaotic and rushed. And I hate that. And that's what I really wanna work on. I mean, it's really tap into stopping that habit of having so many things in progress that nothing gets done and everything is chaos. And what I've identified is just one thing at a time. So I have this one handwork project in progress. I have this double wedding ring. I have one quilt that I want to quilt on my long arm next that's going to get put on the long arm in the next day or so. I have one project that yeah, I am determined to get it done on my embroidery machine. And, you know, it's like just those three things is plenty. That is a lot on my plate, you know? And, it, you know, and for me, I have a lot of challenges too because, you know, I've also got to be thinking ahead and it's like, okay, what's our next project? What's dad working on? You know, what's Josh working on? And kind of keeping everybody busy there too. That's a whole different, that's a whole different ball of wax. But really staying laser focused. I think there is so much value to that and it is so hard because there's so much, you know, there's so many kits and there's so much stuff and there's so many UFOs and there's, you know, uh, right now I've just got this gigantic mess downstairs because of, of pulling out the long arm room and still not getting everything back in place. And it's, and it's keeping things clean and organized and using that, uh, to keep the chaos down and to keep things very, very focused. So I think there's definite value in that. And if you are a single project quilter, I, I just have to wonder for the single project quilters, you know, do you get more stuff done? Do you feel like you get more stuff done? And are you more satisfied with those things that you get done because you're laser focused on it and not got 17 balls in the air at any given time. I just have to wonder, um, you know, there was a time that I was a single project quilter and I was mostly that um, after Josh and I got married because, you know, during the, the main time I was sewing and sewing professionally so I could not have any other projects out while I was sewing 
because that was my main thing. And then I didn't have any money <laughs> to spend on any fabric other than one quilt at a time. And I had a fabric stash that was literally like it fit in a little box under my bed. And that was it. I had no other fabric than that. Um, so when I think back to that time, it was like, there was no option to go buy more fabric or get distracted with another project. It was, I have got to take this through to completion because I need that quilt for my bed, number one. And then also there is not space for more projects in this, you know, we had very, very tiny little apartment. And when I think back to that, I mean, those, it was frustrating. It was very hard to feel limited in that way. But at the same time, I got a lot more done. You know, I got my first quilt knocked out in a month or two and, you know, second quilt done in a month or two. And these were not super simple, small quilts. They were pretty complex and I was designing them myself. I was not working off of pattern. So when I think back to that, I really think having that laser focus, it's something I want to get back to. It really is. I think that might be the key guys. And it also, I think might be the key to keeping a project very meaningful too, because you know, how can a project be meaningful if it's like one of seven that are in progress at any given time. It, it can't be, right? So I think focusing, understanding what you're getting into, understanding from the outside, wow, I have picked a, you know, complex Baltimore album show quilt. Go into that understanding the challenge. Go into that expecting to be looking at that quilt a year from now, okay? And that kind of mind blown, you know, to actually think, okay, it is September, 2019 right now. And I could be looking at that quilt again, still on my sewing machine or just, or like I'm putting the binding on in September, 2020. So consider that guys, that, that is a very real possibility for something like that. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know? Spending the time on the project is what's required to take it through to completion. And as I said in the last podcast, leaving unfinished projects behind can be a burden on your family. And it's not nice. You know, it's not a good thing to do. Um, it, it has, it will leave, it will leave them with something that they can't use, but then they might not be able to get rid of out of guilt. And that is a really stuck kind of thing. You don't want that. So I hope that this podcast has helped you. I hope that it has given you some insight and inspiration. Uh, I know I'm going to be getting my little Express Your Love framed up nicely. I'm so excited about that. You know, and this is just one of those things. As simple as it seems, you know, just buying the right sized frame for a quilt, you know, was challenging. It, you know, it was like, when I got that finally pulled out, I had the frame, I pulled everything out, I laid the quilt, I, I opened the frame, I, I put it in there and it didn't fit. And it was like, oh, so now I have an extra frame I don't need that doesn't fit the quilt that I bought it for. And then I had to go buy another frame and that took another week to get my act together to go buy the other frame. So these things add up, you know, it's processing through like the disappointment of it not working out. And then, oh, I've got this extra frame hanging around, you know, and all those other, I mean, silly, but, it's there. The stuff is real. It slows us down. We get bogged down with it. And then the quilt stays in a drawer and doesn't end up getting displayed or used, you know, in the way that it was intended. So understand how things get stuck. Understand the time factor, the very real time investment that we put into our quilts, into our projects. But that is worth it. You know, in the end, I'm going to give this double wedding ring to my mother-in-law. It is something I have wanted to create for myself for a very, very long time. And I think after I make hers, I will start mine, you know, because I, I'll, I'll have gained the skill and the speed of piecing it this way that then I'll be able to start my double wedding ring and be able to make one for myself. And I love that. That will be completely awesome. Um, and I think that's where it's at. It's picking the right projects and it's not just buying to buy or buying to fulfill that creative itch 
uh, within ourselves. And I have absolutely fell into that trap for a very, very long time. It's why I have such a gigantic bead collection. And it's not like I'm doing bead work every day, right? It's why I have such a gigantic wool collection. And it's not like I am spinning wool, spinning yarn every day. Uh, it's easier to buy than it is to create. But we've got to create if we are creators, OK? So I am stepping off my soapbox. You guys have heard it all. I hope that this episode has helped you. Definitely go back and listen to our last podcast episode about finishing your UFOs. It's a 10-step program. Everybody should get on it <laughs> so we can finish our projects and really start using and enjoying them in our home. So until next time, guys, let's go quilt.